Um, I'm gonna introduce our moderators tonight. We have Shirley Pang. She's a managing attorney at the Disaster Relief Project and Tax Law Project at Legal Aid Nebraska. And she's also a realtor with Berkshire Hathaway. She graduated from UCLA in Chapman Law and moved to Lincoln in 2009 from Orange County, California. And she also sits on leadership council for YPG. Also, we have John Schreier, um, who is the opinion editor for the Lincoln Journal Star, a position he's held since April of 2017. Um, he is a UNL graduate and a sixth generation Nebraskan, so please help me welcome them. And let, I'll turn it over to John. Uh, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, I will introduce our candidates. Um, Larian Gaylor Baird, City Councilwoman, and Cindy Lamb, also City Councilwoman. And we'll get started here with the forum. So uh, I will start with Larian with the first question. Um, how do you plan to involve young professionals in the decision-making process in Lincoln? Thank you, and thank you to the young professionals for having us. I think the fact that you're so motivated to have a forum like this speaks highly of your commitment to having a bright future for all of us here in Lincoln, and I look forward to your input. Uh, I think that one of the ways that we can secure effective, informed input from young professionals is through our valued partnership with the Lincoln Chamber of Commerce, and the policy committee that was just mentioned uh, I think could play a vital role. I know that when I was uh, a judge for the My Turn Pitch event that was also organized by the Chamber of Commerce. We got to hear from a lot of young students and uh, aspiring professionals, and there were really differences of perspective that were noteworthy, particularly with the number of young, young people who had different visions for the Pershing block. And those different pitches that were made during that event were written up and delivered to the DLA because the DLA, of course, is interested in downtown projects, but so is the mayor's office. And I think that as the chamber and the policy group develop plans or perspectives that ought to be heard by city leaders, we should welcome them, and as mayor, I certainly would. Of course, an, an easy way to get young people involved, and one that I plan to do, is through leadership opportunities. The city has a number of boards and commissions and task force and committees, and those are wonderful ways to get involved. And I certainly got my first involvement in city work uh, through the planning commission, so you, know, you never know where it may lead. Um, and lastly, I think we have opportunities to continue to modernize the way we seek information and input at the city through the use of technology and improvements to our website, online surveys. So I think that, that those are all ways that we can work to effectively secure vital input from you all. Hello. My name is Cindy Leon. Thanks very much for having me. I'm very impressed by the group here. Not only that, I'm very impressed by the size of the room because when I came in the front door, I thought, oh, I don't think they're going to fit very many people here. <laughs> so this is a nice surprise room. Thank you for filling it up. I appreciate that. The view from every aspect of our community, including young professionals, is extremely important in forming the future of our city. I've already talked about having town halls throughout our city, one in each quadrant, which I would hope that young professionals in various parts of the city would join in. Um, also, you may uh, remember or may have even participated in one of uh, Senator Epke's Pines and Politics, which I think seems to definitely fit a group of this sort or have an, uh, certainly an interest to a number of people. And I think those are great opportunities to do some informal brainstorming. Uh, one of the things that I really value are people who think outside of the box, and I find more and more that young professionals and young entrepreneurs don't even have a box, and I like that best. So um, I think those ideas are extremely important. I think inviting interns uh, into City Hall and having young people work with us and young professionals work with us on developing a technology plan would be a great opportunity for the city to hear more and be more aware of the needs of young people in um, our city. And I would think that something like the neighborhood roundtable that we have um, at City Hall, which involves neighborhood organizations, would be uh, also something, a model that we could use in order to involve those young professionals uh, at the chamber and through chamber events that wanted to have some type of participation and input uh, into city government and the direction that our city is taking. Great, thank you ladies. Unemployment in Lincoln is remarkably low. As our city's leader, what is your role in attracting and retaining top talent, and what strategies would you use to retain young professionals? Am I first? Sure. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, I think the city ro city's role in city leadership is extremely important uh, in attracting and retaining young professionals and a workforce. Workforce development is extremely important. I think we have to be able to work with strategies towards, and I see this as the next question, but forgive me, I know housing affordability is extremely important if we're gonna attract and keep uh, young, young people here and not only attract them, but really retain them. Um, one of the things that I was sharing with someone is I live uh, in University Place and my, two of my children and six of my eight grand grandchildren live on my block. And I love that, it's a real blessing and it adds fullness to my life. This is a place where we can do that, Lincoln, Nebraska, and I would wanna work on strategies that kept those young people attracted and make sure that Lincoln appeals to them in, for, in form of housing affordability when you wanna buy your first home, in forms of entertainment industry. We've done a great, yard, a great job down in the rail yard in forming that, um, entertainment industry, if you will, and but also to have a community that's affordable, that they know if they stay here, not just housing, but affordable livability. Um, so I would be developing strategies for, in, with that in mind, and I'll get into a little more probably in the housing affordability um, question, but I think that those are important things. We need to have a vibrant and prosperous city where we entertain and invite new businesses, new ideas into City Hall, uh, and really leverage uh, the brilliance that we have in young people in this community. I was sharing with someone that at my headquarters, my IT guy is 12. <laughs> because he can fix anything really quickly. And so as things advance, we can never overlook the importance of involving uh, younger uh, professionals and younger people in city government. To thrive, businesses have to have access to highly qualified and talented people. And one of the ways that we attract highly qualified, uh, qualified and talented people to our community is to create a place where they want to live. And so we want to make sure that Lincoln is safe and affordable, but we also want to make sure that it's exciting and attractive. And I'm really pleased with the vision that we've outlined and that I helped work on with the downtown master plan that looks to build on the assets that Lincoln offers young people, in particular, our robust music scene, the idea of creating a music district, music district, music cities across the country have better success in attracting young people and having more diverse cultural offerings and we know that that's an important part of creating loyalty in a community along with our bikes and trails network which of course is not only fun and gives us a great way to get exercise but is also something that we've heard downtown businesses tell us is part of what they want to help attract a millennial workforce and it's why so many of them got behind the end street bikeway project and so many of them are sponsoring some of those bike share stops and, and stations. In fact, the number one users of the bike share include these, among the youngest you know, the folks who live at the N Street Lofts. That, the best traveled pathway on the bike share is from the N Street Lofts to the university. So we can work to create an environment that people want and to work with those young people coming out of university through partnerships with our schools. And to the extent that we are a capital city and a university town, that relationship with our universities is another key strategy. And so we need to make sure that we have effective partnerships with the universities where we're working together, not only to grow our city, but to grow their campuses. And then I would also say, the economic opportunity has to be there for young professionals. And I'm really proud to have supported through the few economic development tools we have at the city, opportunities to grow businesses like Huddle and like Olson and some of the companies that have taken chances in the West Haymarket to grow their businesses and create good paying jobs so that people coming out of school have not only a place they want to be, but a way to afford to be able to stay. And lastly, uh, we also know that Younger professionals want to live in a place that is welcome and tolerant, inclusive, and appreciates diversity. And we need to make sure that we work towards eliminating discrimination and promoting and securing equality for all our residents in Lincoln. That's a key factor as well. So the next question is, a top concern for young professionals in Lincoln is access to affordable housing. What's more important for our city right now? building new homes and commercial space designed for the needs of young professionals, or rehabbing and better utilizing our existing homes and storefronts? I mean, 
And the short answer is yes to both because you've got to do both. Um, the housing affordability is becoming an issue in, for many thriving cities. It's partly a result of our success in growing this community. More people want to be here. There's more competition for, for housing. So with a complex challenge like this, we really have to do what we can from the public side uh, in partnership with the private sector and with our nonprofit um, resources like NeighborWorks and the Lincoln Housing Authority and others who are experts in this field. With regard to commercial space, um, we definitely want to make sure that we are allowing businesses to grow so that people have incomes. A lot of the housing problem actually has to do with the discrepancy between income stagnation and what people are making in their wages and then the rising cost of housing. So uh, what we can do to create jobs is going to be key to how we make sure that people can afford to live in Lincoln. Along with other, uh, other tactics that the city can take are to make sure that we have quality, low, low income and affordable housing stock that already exists, improving the quality of that, um, with, whether through targeted inspections or making sure that renters understand their rights and responsibilities. That's one strategy that we have. And also working to create and innovate. We have a concept called a community land trust, and it's working in other communities. We don't have one of those in Nebraska yet, but we should look, and, other, and some people in our community are, exploring how we might create Nebraska's first community land trust, which puts certain properties into permanent states of affordability at the same time that it helps revitalize neighborhoods. And I am very pleased that uh, I am one of the members of the council who voted for the budget last year that created uh, funds for affordable housing initiatives. And we're looking right now at spending some of those funds to create new housing in the, in the hay market that will have affordable units set aside. So the more we can do that, the better off we will be. So like I said, I get to talk to about housing affordability again. And my short answer is both. We have done a great job of working in the downtown area in order to provide rental housing um, that is affordable and to also renovate some houses uh, and homes, single family homes and rentals that are available as you move outside of downtown. It is time though that we make available more affordable lots and affordable housing stock on the outer edges of town as people decide that they want to stay and start families here. If they're going to stay and start families, we need to be able to have starter homes or beginning homes, if you will, um, that fit into every income category. I differ uh, with my opponent on uh, land trusts. I think land trusts unfairly put the city in competition uh, with the private sector. I think what we need to do as a city, the last budget actually had 99 fees and rate increases uh, within that budget. And if we are going to um, help housing be affordable, we need to help from the front end as government. We need to make it less onerous for those builders and investors who want to build uh, new homes and renovate. And by, by uh, less onerous, I mean not as expensive on the front end, um, also not as time consuming, which obviously adds um, expense to any projects that are being built. We need to really focus on helping our young professionals not only live and enjoy downtown while you're at the uh, at your time in life where you want to do that, but as you maybe want to get a little bit further away from the music scene or buy your home and, and mow your own front lawn and so forth, be able to have that starter ho housing stock on the outskirts of town. So. Um, we can do this in a number of different ways. In addition to building codes and uh, standards that, and licensing that we can help the process be streamlined up front, perhaps through the use of better technology and a technology plan, we can also look at zoning and rezoning so that we can have commercial space that can be built into neighborhoods so the neighborhoods become more affordable overall. Uh, right now, some of our zoning stands in the way of that. We can. Uh, adjust our zoning and our pro, uh, processes and um, policies so that we can open up more land so it becomes more affordable at the outskirts of town. That would be my plan as mayor uh, to really 
dig into those things to look at what can we do to help things be more affordable. Any economic, uh, economist would tell you that the best way to have a flourishing economy is to have a plan at City Hall that's fiscally responsible and that includes a reasonable taxes and fees for its residents, and that's absolutely what I will be working for as mayor. And what will you do to prioritize innovation in the Lincoln community while balancing the interests of incumbent industries that provide jobs now? Work closely with the university. Work closely with the Chamber of Commerce. We really need to leverage the uh, brilliance that we have in young people coming out of our university and Rake's uh, school. If we develop a citywide technology plan, not only will it save us money, because right now we have each department deciding what its needs are and determining what technology it'll use, and the heads of the department aren't necessarily experts in technology, whereas there are a lot of young professionals and people coming out of the Rake School that would be. We leverage those uh, the amazing resources we have in, in, in human capital, if you will, in our students and young people help us develop a technology plan that'll move things forward, that'll help our city become innovative. We need to also, uh, once again, reach out to folks like Verizon, who were here a couple years ago, wanting to make us one of the first 20 cities to be, uh, first 20, 100, uh, top 100 cities, to be 5G uh, city, and we, charge them too much to hook up to our poles. We charge about four times what other communities were willing to allow them to put 5G in for. We lost out on tens of millions of dollars in their investment, but even more importantly, we put ourselves behind the eight ball as far as if we want to have uh, driver, driverless, techno driverless technology in our town, we're going to have to have 5G. If we want to spur innovation uh, in businesses throughout the community, we need to have 5G. The University Property and Innovation Campus is far ahead of us as a city, which is wonderful because it becomes an incubator. But if we're going to have uh, a successful city, which really invites new businesses and new ideas and innovation, we need to make sure that we start at City Hall by inviting in the technology and the people that can bring the technology to make it happen. Innovation will be a core value and a mindset, really, in my administration at City Hall. And uh, that means being open to change, unafraid of change, and having an open mind at the same time that we are honoring traditions that we hold dear. And I think that building stronger innovation ecosystems and working to modernize the operations within City Hall will be some of the ways that would look internally at the operations of the city. But then externally, we have a lot that we can do in terms of forging partnerships. And I've been so pleased to have supported the partnership with Allo that made us a one gig city. That's an exciting initiative. We have more to do to eradicate the digital divide. And there are people in this community who are taking a look at that and how we can make sure that innovation and access to technologies, something that all in our community are enjoying. And I think we're really fortunate to have a vibrant startup community that is working to bang the drum and elevate the success of all. I think they re recognize that despite their competition for capital, that the better that they all are doing, that the rising tide is lifting all of those boats. And for government, a lot of that's getting out of their way and making sure that they have connections and access to others in the community who can help them. And so with this question about does this, you know, do you focus on startups versus uh, new businesses, I actually think they're not mutually exclusive. And I'm really pleased with how many of our existing businesses are mentoring the startup leaders in our community. They're in fact investing in those businesses and helping them grow. And I think they see a, almost a generational sort of uh, handover in some cases of influence and opportunity. And those established businesses are also a big reason for the success that we're enjoying today and some of the innovations. My children, two of them are in the IB program at Lincoln High because Union Bank has helped sponsor that program and get it off the ground. They wanted Lincoln High to be a strong school and helped create the IB program to help strengthen the, in the infrastructure of academia there. The scholarships at SCC, I think, were another Union Bank sponsored program. When you have locally owned, established businesses that have been here for generations and want to remain and be good stewards of our community, they can work in tandem with our newer businesses to have a, a strong and vibrant business community that is supporting innovation 
and I would love to be a public partner in those efforts. And uh, so I would also just <laughs> I would also just point out that um, I'm really pleased with some of the work we've done with Bloomberg Philanthropies at the city. I initiated a relationship with them to help spur on our open data initiative. And that has led to other partnerships, including the bringing of the autonomous shuttle, the pilot, and the mayor's challenge. That's something that I know a lot of you are familiar with and would like to see uh, advancements in our transit system going forward. Young professionals see equality as a top concern. If elected, how would you ensure equity and inclusivity in the city? As I mentioned before, this is just a matter of being a good neighbor to our friends, family, and neighbors in the LGBTQ community. It's about doing what's right and being on the right side of history. And it also makes a lot of economic sense if we want to compete as a city and a community and a state. If we don't want to be flyover country, we've got to say we welcome everyone to land here, every kind of family to grow here. So part of it is having a firm stance about that, about being a welcoming leader in the public sector. I also am deeply grateful to the young professionals. I was really proud to sit next to you at the Judiciary Committee and testify alongside, testify alongside you in support of workplace equality. We need to achieve that for our state. And you know, should we not be able to do that at the state legislature or through the courts, then we, with the, with the consent and leadership of the LGBTQ community, can certainly push forward at the local level and take it to the ballot box if, in fact, we have to resort to that. I do, th I do want to say that I don't believe civil rights are something that should be subject to a vote. But if that's the, if that's the course that the community wants to take, I would support that. When I look at the uh, equality and inclusivity in our city, I see faces from many nations, many, many countries, many states in our, um, in our community. And I've been very pleased with the work that's being done at the New American Task Force to help integrate those refugees that are coming to our city and to help them not only to settle in and get to know our city well, but also to flourish in our city, to plant where they've now been, uh, to grow where they've now been planted, to help them not only with their cultural festivals, which I think we absolutely should continue as a city and encourage, cultural fest festivals and uh, training to allow them to take the, the, um, the jobs and careers that they've chosen in their home countries and actually flourish with them here and start new businesses. I think equality is important uh, across our city in every sector and in every uh, area of life that we need to make sure that each individual and each business has opportunity to succeed here in our city. And inclusivity naturally, uh, in my opinion, uh, includes the ability of everyone to have civil discourse about those ideas on which they disagree or on which they agree but perhaps find a different path to agree. Um, in, in government, it's really important that we uh, be able to have all views on the table in order to really be inclusive and to have civil dialogue. When I grew up, um, my, so my parents were each married four times, so I have what I call a family bush and I have about 13 siblings, and we are everywhere across the spectrum, both politically and religiously. And we've never shied away from discussions about politics or religion, and we all still love each other. And we do that by putting everything out on the table and really valuing the opinions of one another. What is your opinion? What is your feeling on this issue and why? On a scale of one to 10, how strongly do you feel about that? How strongly do I feel about it? And when we come together, is your reasoning then going to be more important in my view because I value who you are? And so I absolutely uh, believe as a community, that's the place we come to. That as I govern, um, as I work with city leaders, we will put everything out on the table in true transparency, establish worthwhile goals, include every aspect of our community, and in reaching those goals, we may differ in the ways to get there, but of course we can get there as long as we all know that's the goal. Lincoln has a variety of available transportation options, private vehicles, bikes, 
buses, cabs, and ride-sharing apps. However, some young professionals feel that the efficiency of movement across the city could be improved. What will you do to make getting around and across town faster, safer, and easier? I love this question because I was working with Star Trek and Bus when we realigned um, the routes. And one of the things that I think would be great, and, and of course we have a lot of different modes of transportation, so I'll deal with that one first though. I believe that we should have um, park and ride, we should establish a park and ride system that allows people from the outer outskirts of town to come downtown and work uh, and shop and, uh, and seek entertainment, which means we need new routes, uh, excuse me, not new routes, but more frequent routes. Um, but if we had a hub in each area of the city, each quadrant, we would also be able to travel further uh, by the, um, our transit system. Um, also, I would like to see, I think we have a real important need for something that will get us from north to south as quickly as possible. And that kind of has been lacking. I think that we should make priorities, of course, completing the south beltway and also then working on the east beltway in order to get folks around town. I would like to see us so also explore once again, I think it's time to re-explore uh, making widening 27th Street south of O Street so that we could uh, travel from north to south. It's the only street that travels north to south all the way through. And I believe that that's definitely an option we need to get out there in the community and visit with about uh, once again so that it's not taking so long. I like to get across town as quick as anyone else, but it does become more and more difficult um, as we slow traffic and get more traffic in the downtown area. Um, I know that we are, there's a plan to maybe take away some of the, of the lanes downtown. I'm not certain how that's going to work. I mean, I'm open to exploring what is that going to do, but I think we have to be able, especially in my administration, we will, to be responsive to the transportation needs of folks in all modes of transportation, both in downtown and across our city. Over the past six years as your representative on the council, citywide representative, um, I have voted to fund street improvements at historic levels. I have voted to make safety improvements like the ones we got done as a community on South 13th Street and to expand public transit routes and service hours. And I'm the only person in this race who's voted for the budgets that actually get all of this accomplished. It's really important it's, you know, to say that you support these things, but you actually have to find a way to get them done. And I'm really proud of the progress we've made over the past six years. I've also supported the purchase of new pothole repair equipment, which of course is now using new technologies that help get it done at a much faster rate. And um, I'm proud of the work we've even done, you know, just to make pedestrian crossings safer and more accessible to everyone in our community. Some of the improvements and changes we've made on P Street, for instance, and we'll be making on Q Street to make some of the crosswalks uh, smaller and less wide will actually help those who are choosing to walk in our community. Uh, as far as my vision for the future, I think we're we're fortunate that we're going to have uh, new resources thanks to the voters to improve our streets. And when we make those improvements, I expect you'll see traffic flowing faster and more efficiently throughout the community. Our Greenlight Lincoln program has been another way to creatively use technology to enhance our signalization to help optimize it move people through at key times of the commute. Uh, as a planning commissioner, you get to, a former planning commissioner, and of course on the city council, you see the maps where we have the most congestion and at what times, and so of course we need to prioritize road improvements during, uh, accordingly, so that we get the, the highest yield for our investments. And while cars are certainly our primary means of transportation, and will remain so, I, I like to think of us living in a world where bikes and cars are mutually beneficial. The fact that we have an expanded trails network and more opportunities for people to bike to work means that for people who choose to drive cars, there are more parking spaces and also less traffic on our streets. So I, I believe that a multimodal transit system is another way that we will continue to create efficiencies and also, of course, um, be a competitive community for people who want to have options of how they move through our community. Um, 
I do want to just go back to our last question for a moment because I wanted to also, in talking about equality, throw out a challenge to the YPG group. Um, in the meantime, while we wait to get legislation accomplished that will ensure equality for the LGBTQ community, I think one possible opportunity or project is to help tell the story of the businesses in Lincoln who are aware of the benefits of having workplace anti-discrimination policies and tell those stories and share them and share their HR practices. And I think the YPG group could be a really tremendous resource in sharing those practices and, and policies and making them known. I think that when you start to look at ways to affect change in communities, while we certainly want this to, civil rights to be ensured in the law, nudges and telling those story and having people realizing, mm, my company doesn't do this, why not, could be a, a in the meantime sort of approach. And I think you guys could do a lot to help us get that done. If elected, how do you plan to address environmental issues at the local level? Well, I'm pleased with the progress we've made in partnership with so many voices in the community. They're calling for attention to issues of sustainability and addressing climate change and its local impact. When I think about what it's going to be like to sit in the mayor's office, I think about how do we protect our infrastructure. And we all went through this incredible experience recently of having our water supply <coughs> threatened. And we only have one source right now in Lincoln, and it's up at the Platte River. We, of course, are going to be searching for a, a pathway to a second water source, and we're going to need one by about the year 2040. Uh, and one of the rate increases that we had in the last budget was to start setting aside money now for the year that we have to build out to the Missouri. That's a cost that's going to be significant, an incredible capital investment of infrastructure, and we're not going to get there uh, in one bond issue. We need to start setting aside resources for it today. And planning ahead for the long term is something I'm going to be committed to as mayor. But when it comes to uh, addressing issues of the environment, it's important to acknowledge that the accelerated rate of climate change is happening. It's real. It's man-made. And there are things we can do about it to address it on the local level. And the reason that we should is that it has real impacts on our daily lives. The studies coming out of University of Nebraska predict that we'll have more days in the summer that are over 100 degrees, more nights in the summertime that are over 70 degrees. Our soil is going to have less moisture. There are really significant impacts for an ag economy and for the larger state. But we also need to be looking at how we protect our citizens here in our city. If we have more severe weather impacts, how are we doing in, for residents who are living in floodplains? What kinds of work can we do to protect them in cases of floods uh, or emergencies? And do people have air conditioning? And do, how do we prepare for different kinds of temperature swings? These are all things that we as a community can take a look at. And what I would like to see is an analysis of our resiliency. Where do we have gaps in protection for our residents? This really is a security issue. And how can we plan to be a more resilient community? Some of it, you might be surprised, isn't just about uh, spending money on infrastructure. Some of it is about creating community cohesion so that neighbors know each other and know to look for each other in times of disaster. Uh, uh, there's a climate resiliency plan being developed for Spearfish, South Dakota, and these are the kinds of things that they're finding, is that part of how you have a resilient community is having people who know each other and look out for each other. Um, there's a lot of work that we need to do. We need to take it seriously, and I'm very committed to that. I love the idea of a resiliency plan, and I've been looking at those myself, and I think as mayor, I would want to work closely with the University of Nebraska to develop that resiliency plan for Lincoln, Nebraska. Always keeping in mind, of course, that we all should be good stewards of our environment. We all want clean water and clean air to breathe. But we should not be slaves to our environment. We have to make sure that we are also serving the community in the best way possible and um, giving the focus of all of our work to how do we help make the community and quality of life better for people in Lincoln. In my opinion, we do that through incentivizing folks to take better care of their environment, not mandating it, but actually showing what is what are the advantages of taking care of our environment, how can we do it best, how can we participate it, in it as citizens. Um, I know in my family we do our recycling at home and um, we for 
I know we have a recycling ban on cardboard. We go beyond that, and I think a lot of people do go beyond that and take it seriously, and there's a great deal of awareness building in our community about the environment and how do we tend to it and make sure that we take care of it. Let's incentivize people to go further in their own recycling rather than mandating, or I, I believe in the carrot approach rather than the stick approach. Uh, and so uh, I would be pursuing that type of environment. I think we can do, through uh, city government, we can do PSAs to help bring people along with their knowledge of what is happening uh, in our water, in our community, in our recycling, in our uh, plants. I was talking to a gentleman today because we had been talking about uh, at the landfill, I had been approached at one point about all of the, for instance, the roofing tiles or shingles that are at our landfill that once they uh, are wet or soiled, they can't be used in recycling by the city. And so there they are sitting out there instead of us passing them on to perhaps and exploring other options uh, as a city, other companies that are willing and able to take care of recycling those types of, of materials. I would like to just use a moment though to address what I think is an, an implication by my opponent that somehow I don't support things because I didn't vote for a, the budget. And she is one of the only, <coughs> the only person in this race because she did vote for the budget. And I would just remind everyone in this room that I have not voted for a budget with a tax hike. I do not believe that taxes should be, new taxes should be imposed unless it's the last resort. And in the last couple of budgets, that has certainly been the case. And no, I didn't vote for the last budget. I didn't vote for the 99 increases in uh, fees and rates. Um, and, but that doesn't mean I don't support funding our infrastructure. I have fought hard and I have fought consistently for reprioritizing so that we do work with the infrastructure of our city that we provide for the needs of our citizens and taxpayers over the wants. And I will continue to do that as mayor. I still believe and will continue to believe that only after you've exhausted other options should be you be raising taxes. Again, I get back to the affordability of living here. We want to keep people, if we want to attract people, if we want to keep our families and our kids and our grandkids here and attract more people, we have to make sure that we have an affordable economy where people recognize that there are reasonable taxes and fees and that we are going to be transparent enough to show where all the money's going so that if we need additional taxes, it's the last resort and people know it's the last resort, follow a dollar in and a dollar out and know why we need it. Well, that's a great segue to the next question. Discuss your approach to budgeting. What will you prioritize and why? Thank you. Yeah, so I prioritize needs over wants. <laughs> that was the easy part of the question. Um, the role of government is the safety and protection of the people that are governed and their property. And I think that is a, those are the focuses. I absolutely would focus on public safety, including our infrastructure. Those things need to be first. Uh, we need to take care of police and fire. Our roads uh, need to be able to be traveled in a safe manner, well maintained. From there, we would be prioritizing based on those other things that are perceived as needs in the community. What do we need to do inside City Hall in order to we will look at every department from the top down in order to determine if we are being efficient in how we deliver our services. And if there are services that we're not meeting, we can take uh, with community roundtables and neighborhood roundtables, we will determine exactly what those needs are. We also can look at uh, bringing in private partnerships. I've visited with businesses throughout the community who would be very much interested in actually having, uh, perhaps not naming rights, but actually um, some type of partnership with different parks in the city where they could have a plaque in that park, their company would in, uh, infuse or put together an endowment that would take care of that park that wouldn't be the city's expense and that in exchange they, uh, they would be able to have the plaque and they would also take care of it with their, by involving their uh, employees uh, and partners, which is an important aspect. So I think that we have, when we look at priorities, we have to look at what, do, what protects our citizens, what protects their property, what do we need to do to make sure that that takes place. And from there, we prioritize further needs as we go down. Now, let me talk about the process, because I think the process is really important. We worked uh, really hard, and I worked hard to, to have a more um, open and um, 
earlier process of the of the budget when we worked on the budget after the 2016 um, budget where the mayor actually um, sued the city council and I wasn't talking give do the mayor's budget give it to us as a council sooner and then let us figure out you know have an extra week or two to figure out what what changes we will want to make as mayor what I would do is I would involve the city council in the process of developing the budget before it ever went to the city council um, as I explained my leadership style is one where everything's transparent out on the table let's work together for an agreed-upon worthwhile goal and even though we may not agree on how to get there and the same is true of the budget at least there won't be any secrets. No one will get to the end of the process. And I, I have consulted with other mayors in communities that didn't um, have the stalemate that we had, and these are even strong mayor communities, and find that the openness and the transparency with the people that are elected to represent the citizens, the earlier they're involved in the process, the better the process goes, and the better budget that we can uh, develop as a city and agree upon and serve the people of Lincoln best. I think that conversations about the budget and how you lead a city really start with a really high level question about how you help people in this community reach their fullest potential as human beings and what is the city's role in that, in its delivery of key services. And um, when I first moved into my home in the near south, I had a four month old baby girl in my arms and I was thinking a lot as a parent about how I keep my baby safe and how I pr provide for her basic needs and how to make sure that she has the same kinds of opportunities as any other child in the community and has a vibrant quality of life growing up. And as I got more involved in our community to try and make a difference and to try and help secure a brighter future, uh, I realized that so many of those desires I had were really actually the core functions of local government. We are responsible and charged with ensuring public safety, with providing emergency police, fire, and medical protection for all of our residents. We are in charge with taking care of the nuts and bolts of city operations and infrastructure, making sure that the water comes on when you raise the tap or that your toilet flushes and that, that storm water is, is not flooding your basement. We have important responsibilities with streets and sidewalks in every neighborhood. And of course, we have assets throughout our community and our neighborhood parks and trails and our libraries that help people enjoy a quality of life that I think makes this a wonderful city to call home. And so, uh, and I would add to that actually that the young professional group in coming to city council was among the first to share their concerns about the rising cost of homes and trying to buy that starter home. So I appreciate that attention and initial light that you shed on that issue uh, several years ago, which has been amplified and echoed by many of our residents who've come and testified at council. And these priorities that I'm talking about in the campaign that, of course, are what we work to do in a budget and accomplish in a budget, um, they aren't just my observations as a parent. They are my observations as someone who's been serving you for 12 years in the city council chambers. I have been listening to residents come forward and talk about what they want at planning commission meetings for six years and in city council hearings for six years. And that's really informed my perspective and shaped my direction for and vision for the city going forward as mayor. And other guiding principles also have a lot of public process. Our comprehensive plan and our capital improvements plan, those are important and rich guiding documents that inform what we are trying to accomplish through our budget, the real key projects that that are in the queue, and those are documents that I pay a lot of attention to because a lot of public input has gone into them. On the technical side, my professional experience as a former fiscal and policy analyst uh, working on city budgets, I look for efficiencies, I look for ways to make sure that we're eliminating and reducing structural deficits in the budget, that we're using one-time money for one-time expenses, that we're trying to find ways to be a good employer and make sure that we can retain our professionals, and to use technology to eliminate low value tasks so that we can fund and have resources for higher value tasks. So those are some of the, the sort of the professional and technical skills that I bring to looking at a city budget. 
on, uh, on some of the other issues that have been raised. I mean, to me, transparency in government, along with open data, along with having public records, along with having public meetings, is also about standing up and saying what you think cuts ought to be. Uh, in the past, when my colleague has offered a, a reduced rate and a reduced budget, it's been an across-the-board cut with no present presentation of what would actually be cut in the budget. And that's not transparent. That doesn't let you know what you lose if we go with that tax rate or that budget. On the other hand, in my experience working across the aisle, working in bipartisan fashion to actually lead an effort at the council to reduce the tax rate in the face of significant home revaluations, uh, I was very clear about what we should be doing and that we, we actually worked to fund new police and fire protection and used new growth dollars to do that at the same time that we cut the tax rate. And I'm the only person in this race who actually voted for a budget that cut the tax rate in, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, when it comes to not saying what you would actually cut and what fees you think aren't correct, uh, I would like to point out that a lot of those fees are for infrastructure projects that protect our homes and grow our city. You know, stormwater protections, and those we've seen how important that is for protecting people's homes and basements. Uh, and I, I think that to be truly transparent, you need to offer up what it is you're willing to give up to accomplish your goals. Um, my. Uh, I would also say that the lawsuit that happened at council was an unfortunate waste of taxpayer dollars and it came about because the majority at the time wasn't willing to do their job, which was to balance the budget by creating a tax rate that supported it. Uh, that, that, <laughs> that judge's ruling is clear and, and on, in no uncertain terms determined that it was wrong of the council not to do its job. And so, um, you know, we've been through a tough budget that year, but it's the only time in the history of Lincoln that I'm aware of that in recent memory where our current system actually didn't work. But even so, even believing that, I actually brought forward legislation to try and improve the process because I hear the concerns. I hear the, the interest in having better access to the budget and earlier. And so I brought forward and worked with my colleagues to develop legislation that would have the mayor meet with the council regularly, the mayor's staff meet with the council regularly during the January, February, March, April, May months leading up to the release of the budget. Get our input, tell us what the challenges they see, let us give input on what we think the challenges are and what are important priorities. And not only release the budget early, but allow more time for public input in, uh, once it's released. And those have been, I think, good changes and um, ones that we got good bipartisan agreement on and I'm proud to have led that effort. Because I do think that when there are concerns raised and when there are disagreements, we should try to make improvements to a process. Any process can be better. And I'm willing to continue to look at them going forward. But generally speaking, I think our budgeting process has worked well and I think it is responsive to people's concerns. And if it isn't, let us know because we're listening. Identify one success and one failure made by city government. How would you approach those situations differently? I'm really pleased with the success we've had in developing a partnership with Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, I am in a network of leaders called the New Deal Leaders. It stands for Developing Exceptional American Leaders. It's not like FDR's New Deal. And this group brings together mayors and local officials from around the country to share ideas and how to innovate and grow communities well. And during one of those conferences, I learned about the work of the mayor of Louisville, Greg Fisher, who's very big into data and the fact that he had worked with Bloomberg Philanthropies to try and bring about open data for his community. And I wanted to do that here in Lincoln. And I applied for the initial grant. Um, this is free consulting from Bloomberg's folks who have an initiative called What Works Cities. And as a result, we were able to create an open data portal that shares public information, tries to put as much of what we, really data that belongs to you, uh, online and accessible. Something that entrepreneurs can take and, and use if they want to have a business idea, or, um, innovate and do something new with city data to solve problems. 
um, but also there for people to review and have a close-up look at. It also was a performance management initiative so that we have more data-driven decision-making at City Hall. This partnership with Bloomberg Philanthropies also led to our mayor applying for the mayor's challenge that brought about the autonomous shuttle pilot. That's something that put us on the map. We got national recognition for that. And we have also got national recognition uh, for our open data accomplishments. And so, you know, these are ways that we're telling a new story in Lincoln, not just here, but across the country. That was a real success. As far as failures go, I would say we still have a lot of work to do on our city website. And I don't know how many of you have tried to navigate it, but uh, I want to be proud of our city website. And if elected, one of the big changes I would like to make is to make it more customer service oriented, more consumer friendly. When you go to a city website, you should see that you're being empowered to find services that help you live a better life and reach more of your potential in our community. And so it should really be about service delivery, not about departments and org charts. It should have, it should be focused on what we're trying to get done, not who provides it. Because if you don't know who does what in the city, it's pretty tough to find what you need on our city website. And while they've made some changes and improvements, uh, I, I think that we can do a lot better and I'm excited to change it. This is a great question. <clears throat> what I think one of the great successes uh, city government has done is bringing uh, citizens together in order to develop the rail yard into a vibrant, uh, an attractive place in town for everyone. Uh, not only in helping in building the arena and developing the businesses and the community where new, um, new businesses and new restaurants could could thrive and grow, but also in involving citizens in bringing entertainments to the venue that are of wide interest and really providing a place where when, when you have someone come to visit, you're really proud to take them down to the, to the hay market and to the rail yard and really see how a community has worked together to make that happen. And I, I believe that that's a great success from the very beginning where there was the Vision 2015 team, there was resistance to what they, uh, what they vi visioned for our city, but they worked across uh, all kinds of lines in order to collaborate with city government, with uh, city officials, definitely with the community uh, at large, and to really put a great project, which I think has brought a, just a glow to the city of Lincoln and is certainly a place that it attracts many and helps people that do come here and visit come back and want to come back and live. As far as a failure, I do believe that the budget uh, of 2016, that that process uh, was a failure. And I know that my, uh, my opponent and I disagree on whether what happened at the uh, council was uh, warranted or not, I do know that what we ended up with was we ended up with a budget that not one single city council member voted on. We ended up with a budget that was formed by the mayor, not one single city council member cast a vote for anything in that budget. And I think that that spells failure. I think that when the people have an elected official, the elected official needs to have a voice in the budget, and when we had a process where uh, that, that came forward with that budget where the mayor presents a budget, where the city council, the majority of the city council proposes changes and where the mayor, uh, and then it's voted on and passes, the mayor vetoes that and um, then wants a super majority of the council to override that veto or his budget becomes a budget or her budget becomes a budget, that that's a failure. How would I do that differently? As I explained before, I would involve every city council member in the integral parts of putting the get budget together, formation of the budget. That means looking at all ideas, getting everything out on the table, not having any surprises when it's presented, but being able then to work out uh, the various kinks. I would also like to point out that um, any a tax, a tax rate decrease is not a tax decrease. That had a tax increase of a 2016 budget, had a $5 million tax increase in it, and um, that was what we were trying to, to trim down. And when, we, uh, when my colleague brought what she calls a compromise, it just meant that she was uh, it only increasing at half of that. Rather than $5 million, it may have been a $2.5 million increase. And when, uh, in 2017, when we had increases that were presented, we did have opportunity. I dug into the budget, and I found that we had the funds to, uh, without raising the taxes, an extra million dollars, to go ahead and fund those 
items that were being uh, sought after in the increased budget. And I think that's what we have to do. As officials, it's our responsibility to go look. Where are the pots of money? Where are the streams of money that aren't being used that could be used more efficiently? And what, by involving the city council elected officials in every aspect of the budget, we'll find it together. There's more openness. Transparency is hugely important. We have to know that as elected officials, and when elected officials in my administration will know that when they ask questions of city staff, they need to get clear and transparent answers, and we all need to work together in order to come up with a common goal to serve our city's best interests. On a lighter note, what neighborhood do you live in, why, and where are your favorite places to spend time in Lincoln? That is a lighter note. <laughs> that is my favorite question of all. And I gotta tell you, these were very thorough. When I saw this list of questions, I said, holy cow, how are we gonna fit all this in? Um, but I live in University Place, and I love living in University Place. I live about a block south of Wesleyan. Um, and what I love about where I live, there are a couple things. In fact, there are many things. And certainly the sense of being in an actual smaller community is one of them because University Place has a very unique character uh, in, its, in its own little downtown area um, with uh, the museums and, and art shops and clothing uh, opportunities to purchase clothing. We're a little short on groceries right now in Northeast Lincoln, so we're working on that still. But love University Place, love to take the kids over to Wesleyan and, and watch them ride bikes and, and explore the ramps. I don't know that they're supposed to be ramps, but they, they are when kids find them. Um, and certainly attend baseball and uh, football games over there. It's been very, very fun. One of my most, my favorite places to go in Lincoln is um, Holmes Lake. And I think that, uh, and I was just had opportunity to be there again on Easter, which I love because the sunlight sh just shimmering across the water is just so reassuring and calming no matter how busy life gets or how things seem out of place. It just kinds to put, tends to put the whole world in order. Sit there, cuddle up with uh, you know a kid in my lap and, and watch the water. The most favorite place is my front porch because I have six of my eight grandchildren on my block and I go to my front porch in the spring or the fall and my husband and I are sitting there, we'll have a cup of coffee and I'll hear, Grandma, somebody will be running across the street. And um, to me, my, having my family around me is one of the most important things. Having been homeless on the streets of Lincoln um, as a teenager, I really appreciate the sense of community and family that's available right here to us, all around us in Lincoln. Um, we also have tremendous opportunity through uh, the educational system, so I do like to walk the halls of the Law College once in a while because it's there where I uh, had my dreams come true um, that I thought I would never have. So I, I love those places and I, I love Lincoln in general. It's hard really probably for a lot of people to pick a favorite place because there are so many and they continue to grow. But uh, for me, those are my favorite places. Okay, I gotta tell my story about a porch nun. <laughs> um, I live in the near south, and one of the reasons I love it is there's so many people who are invested in that neighborhood who've been there for a long time, including neighbors I had when I first moved in who had lived there, bought their house when FDR was president. And they were always out on their porch and kept tabs on the neighborhood. And I, I remember taking my toddler over there when she first learned to walk, we'd walk around. And we went over to see Fred. And Fred was on his front porch and he, and he pointed at my house one time and he said, see that house? And I'm like, yeah, he said, it's my house. Like, I couldn't pay me to live in that house. <laughs> I was like, really, why? He's like, no porch. <laughs> so, um, so while I don't have a porch uh, to uh, porch bragging rights at all in this race, you're the candidate with porch bragging rights for sure. Uh, I do love the near south because of the, the neighbors I have. Um, they care, they used to shovel Fred and Verna's walk as they got elderly in um, Shovel the Snow. Um, the gatherings of the Near South neighborhood are vibrant and bring people together and help us remember what it means to be a community. Um, the old trees that provide shade all year long and the fact that it's a pretty cheap Uber ride downtown because we're so centrally located is another plus for me of living in the Near South. Um, but my my family, I guess, what we like to go, we like to go to Zesto's, we like to go to Ivana Cone, we like ice cream, we like to um, go to the parks, and um, 
uh, farmers markets, and of course, I think my children's late fees have helped fund the South Branch library budget for a number of years now. That's another favorite destination for us. Um, when I'm by myself, I like, to, I like to get out to Wilderness Park. I love that in this city, we can be in the woods in about five to seven minutes, depending on where you live. And the beauty, the nature, the opportunity uh, to explore and to just, you know, relieve the stress of everyday life is a wonderful one out there, and I, and I love that park. Um, I sort of have um, unofficial offices at Cultiva and Method and uh, coffee shops around town, and I love local coffee shops for that reason, a chance to, to bump into people you know and, and adore. And, uh, you know, I also like to go to Old Pub Soul Club, and it's this Saturday night for those of you who are interested. Uh, I probably won't be there because it's prom and my daughter's going, but you should check it out. It's a, it's a good time. And thank you to all, everybody who wrote uh, questions. We had some really good ones from the audience, but in the interest of time, we're not going to be able to tackle them. There is one question, though, that we got, I think, that I would like to pose to the candidates because I think it would be beneficial for everyone in this room. And it says, if young professionals in the audience are interested in helping on your campaign, what is the best way for them to get involved? Well, that's a nice question. Thank you. Um, come to my um, office at 830 L Street. We're going to be making a lot of calls and trying to get out the vote. I mean, the turnout for the primary was remarkable, and we want that to continue for the general. We need more people to participate in our local elections. They matter so much to our daily lives. Um, I have a Facebook page, um, Learning for Lincoln, website, learningforlincoln.com. You can follow me on Instagram. Um, there are lots of ways, or just come find me tonight. Thank you for your interest in that. My headquarters are at 7501 uh, O Street, suite number 200. would invite everyone to come out. We, are, uh, we have volunteers working the, not only during the day, but certainly during the nights from 5 uh, till 8, and then on weekends, a lot of people uh, to walk doors and, and knock doors. You can go there at each day, or you can call me personally on my cell phone, 402-432-9770. About 32,000 other people have that number. So, but I still answer it, and if I can't get to it right away, I'm happy to answer your call. I have really valued the uh, volunteers that have already been part of my uh, campaign, and I really welcome young professionals. I tell you, my 12-year-old IT guy would like a little bit of relief. <laughs> <laughs> he seems to be able to fix things quicker than anybody. <laughs> but so we have all types of, uh, of things that can be done at the campaign. And I appreciate uh, you being here tonight and paying such close attention and the opportunity to share uh, my vision of a Lincoln that's safe and prosperous and vibrant and um, offers opportunity for every individual and business to succeed. Thank you both. Please, please join me in thanking Lirian and Cindy for being here tonight and sharing the information. <laughs> we hope that this conversation will help you make a decision on May 7th. Don't forget to vote. You have two more days. You have till 6 p.m. in April 26th um, to go to the election office and register to vote. So if you haven't, you really should. Um, again, thanks to our sponsor, Lincoln Journal Star, LNKTV, in 1867. Um, engagement with our wonderful community is what leads to policies and leaders that expand um, opportunities for, for young professionals. So thank you all for being here, and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>